you cry I'm missing you to sleep tonight I know it's strange and not the grass The back that we can understand The meaning of this life Sometimes it's hard to find But if we learn to look between the lines I think that if we'll open our eyes We're gonna see the sunrise The regret from your hands You gotta fill your mind with new horizons Or your dreams will pack the bags Break the storm, get out of it when you get up in the morning Put a spring, you stop But you can dust off of your feet Step out into the street Everything, everything's gonna be alright Gonna be alright Everything, everything's gonna be alright Good morning, all right. Rich Church Would you all stand with us and worship the Lord this morning?
Good morning and welcome to Ridge Church. Um, it's a beautiful day and we are just so happy that you chose to join us to worship this morning. Um, I want to wish you all happy Memorial Day. We want to thank those of you who have served in our military or who are currently serving. Um, just a heartfelt thank you to you because truly um, you have done more for us than we could ever you know, thank you for or repay you for. Um, truly doesn't go unnoticed and we just really appreciate you. Um, yeah, let's give a round of applause for those. <coughs> um, again, I've, I know I've said this before, but I want to say it again. We invite you to worship however you choose. People worship differently, and that's okay. And um, however you feel led to worship the Lord, just know that here in this church, you are free to do that. So um, just sing with us, and let's just worship together.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to the Father, we thank you for, uh, God, we we just thank you for you. God, we thank you for um, just your presence amongst us this morning. God, we pray that that we've honored you with our singing to you. God, to, to honor you, to bring you glory for your name. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 
Uh, you can have a seat. Uh, my name is Bobby. I'm one of the pastors here at, at the Ridge, and uh, we're so glad that you're with us this morning. Uh, welcome to Ridge Church. You could have been literally anywhere, uh, but yet you chose to be here today. And I believe, as we say every Sunday, I don't think that you ended up here by accident. I believe that God has brought you here on purpose, with a purpose, and uh, it's going to be a great day. So we're so glad that you're here this morning. If you're watching on Facebook Live, welcome. Uh, wherever you are watching today, uh, if you're at the lake, uh, we all are jealous of you. So anyway, um, maybe we'll be there a little later today, but we are glad that you're here. Hey, if you are new, if today's your first day here at Ridge Church, uh, a couple of things that I want you to do. First of all, we're going to give together here in just a moment. So there's going to be some baskets come by our rows. We don't want you to feel obligated at all to give in this moment. You're welcome to if you want to, but you don't feel obligated at all to do that. Uh, but there will be some baskets come by your rows, and, and you can give that way, or we can all give online if you want to at ridgechurch.cc, or ridge, ridgegive.com, actually, sorry, ridgegive.com. We've got too many web, websites. Uh, ridgegive.com, you can, you can do that online uh, here in just a moment. But what we want for, from you, if you are here for the first time today, is we would love for you to take that Connect card that's in your seat close to you. Uh, if you don't have a pen or a Connect card close to you, uh, then you can actually go to, here's another website, ridgechurch.info, and that's just a, an online Connect card, so you can actually fill out your Connect card online uh, if you choose to do that, but uh, that's all we want from you this morning, but if you get a chance on your way out today, there's a table outside these doors here, stop by there, we've got a great volunteer out there, several volunteers who will be there, who would love to answer any questions that you might have, and uh, you can actually turn that Connect card in there as well, and so as we get ready to give, uh, I want to tell you a quick story with this being Memorial Day, uh, one of the things that I always think about on Memorial Day is I think about uh, a good friend of mine, his name uh, was Staff Sergeant Daniel Marshall Morris. And uh, some of you may know Daniel or you knew Daniel. Daniel, uh, he actually has a, a statue, a bust of him out in, in front of the Anderson County Courthouse uh, here in Anderson County, if you've uh, ever been out there. But um, Daniel was a childhood friend of mine. Grew up to, we grew up together. Uh, I, I knew the guy since the first day that I got on the bus as a kindergarten student uh, when I went to school. And we were best friends ever since. since we uh, were roommates together uh, in college and uh, just knew each other uh, until the day that, that he gave his life serving our country uh, in Iraq. And, uh, but one of my favorite stories uh, about him is, uh, and I love to tell this story on Memorial Day because it just reminds me uh, of generosity and sacrifice. And, and so Daniel, on his fourth tour in Iraq, uh, the last two that he did were voluntary. He volunteered to go on the last two. Uh, but on his last one, uh, one of the things that he did was uh, he was able to, to get some New Testament Bibles. And so he took uh, a majority of his gear out of his backpack and filled his backpack up with these Bibles. And so as he was on patrol going through the streets uh, there in Iraq, he was able to give a lot of those New Testament Bibles out and uh, give those to, to kids and, and, and others uh, that were there. And so just, uh, just another picture of sacrifice and what it means to, to give our lives up and, and generosity uh, for others. And, and, and in this moment, as we get ready to give, that's what we say every single week here at Rich Church, is that we give because of God's generosity to us and for us. Because of his generosity to us, it, it enables us, it reminds us to be generous ourselves. And so let's do that. Let's give together, honor him through our generosity. So will you pray with me? Father, we thank you. Uh, God, first of all, we just thank you for you and, and your generosity to us and for us through your son, Jesus. God, we pray uh, also this morning for, for those who have served, those who are serving their families. God, those who have given themselves up uh, in sacrifice, uh, God, to, to serve this country, to, to protect us, to, to bring to us freedoms, uh, God, that, that we so often forget sometimes. Uh, but Father, we are grateful and thankful. We pray that as we give this morning, we honor you in our generosity. God, that we give generously, sacrificially, and with a joyous heart. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Take courage when the road is long. Don't ever forget you are never alone. I sky so blue 
Well, if you have a Bible with you this morning, grab that and open it up to John chapter 13 uh, together. If you didn't bring one, we'll have scripture on the screen behind me. You can follow along there. Uh, or if you have your YouVersion Bible app, be sure to just open that up. And then if you click on more and then events, you'll find Ridge Church should be the first thing that pops up for you. And you can get all of today's notes and scripture right there. And uh, just a side note, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, or maybe you have one that uh, that maybe is in a translation that's kind of hard to read, uh, whatever that that case may be, as you walk out the doors today in the corner right here, uh, there are some blue Bibles out there. It's an ESV version. It's what I, I typically use. And so uh, that's a free gift from us to you. We want you to have one of those. Uh, if you have a stack of Bibles at home with a lot of dust on it, just knock the dust off of one of those and uh, use that. But if you need one, we've got free ones right out there, and we would love to give you one of those uh, on your way out if you need one. So uh, if I were to summarize what it means to follow Jesus, I, I think I think it can be done with just four letters. Just four letters. Now, there's obviously a lot to that, and we're going to explain that in just a moment. But if I was going to say, hey, what does it mean for us to follow Jesus? Here's how I would explain it. And here's the thing. You're probably not going to like it. Let me show you. These four letters. I-N-A-M. I-N-A-M. And you're looking at that. It's like, that doesn't spell anything. You're absolutely right. It does not spell anything. Don't try to pronounce it because it won't work out. But... It does stand for something, and it stands for this. It's not about me. It's not about me. So if I were going to summarize what it means to follow Jesus, that's exactly how I would say it, is I would say, I-N-A-M, it's not about me. So just a little exercise here, a little crowd participation. This is what I want you to do. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, it's not about you. Go ahead, tell them right now. It's not about you. Now, if you said that to a complete and total stranger, they don't like you anymore. (laughs) But, yeah, you're welcome. Just thought I'd let you know right up front. It's not about me. So, if if here's the thing. We don't like, the reason we don't like that, if we really think about it, we don't like it. Now, none of us would ever say, you know what, I don't really like that. I don't think any of us would ever admit the fact that we don't like that. But the reason that we don't like that is pretty simple. And it's because of this. The reason we don't like it is because we are all inherently born selfish. We're all inherently born selfish. And the reason why I know that we are all inherently born selfish is because I look at my own children and I know that they were born selfish. I never taught my children to be selfish. You never taught your children to be selfish. Everybody in the room at one point in time was a child. You were selfish too. And in some ways, we're all still a little selfish in some ways. Here's how I know that. And here's how you know that. There was a a point in time where your kids, maybe somewhere around the age of two years old, they screamed out another four-letter word. I hope it was this four-letter word. And so they screamed out another four-letter word, and this is the word that they said, you all know what it is, what was it? Mine. Mine. Let's see, y'all are so good. You know, you know. I don't even have to, like, I'm preaching to the choir. Y'all already know. And, like, some of y'all have little babies, and you're like, my child's never going to do that. Just wait. They, they're going to do it. Because at some point, it's going to come out of their mouth. They're going to snatch something out of their sibling's hand, maybe even out of your hand, maybe out of a stranger's kid's hand, and they're going to say it, mine. And we've all done that. We've all done that. And the reason for that is, is because... We're all broken sinners. It's just part of the brokenness and the fallacy of our souls is that it's fractured and broken. And because of that, part of that, the way that that works itself out a lot of ways is through selfishness. We were never taught to say the word mine, but yet it just comes out of us. And so for us to go, you know what, it's not about me. Like it's hard for us to think that way. Because even as adults, we still think of things that way. Like, for example, if you've ever been stuck in traffic and you've got mad that you are stuck in traffic, you know, you know what you're thinking, right? You have to get someplace and they are making you late, right? And so we're driving and we're like, this is about me. What if they're late to something and you're making them late, right? 
It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. It's about me. Like if we've ever had to wait a long time in a line at a fast food place, it's like this is fast food, not slow food. Let's get it faster, right? It's about, why? It's because it's about me. Like, and, and we could just go on and on and on and on. But the problem with this is, is that it also tends to creep into other areas of our lives. And it, the church is no exception. It creeps into the church a lot of times. Sometimes we, we show up to church and we go, it's about me. It's about me because here's what I need. I need the right programs. I need the right music. I better like the pastor. He better not step on my toes and make me mad or otherwise I'm not coming back. Like, it's about me. Messages better, like, fit into my way of thinking. Like, if it doesn't, I'm going to go somewhere else and I'm going to find a place where everything can be about me. But you know what? We would never say that out loud. We would never say that out loud. Now, I know there's some exceptions. Some of y'all are, like the first service, they were all broken, dirty sinners, and so it was all about them, but I know it's not all about you, right? Like, none of y'all are like that. But, but we, we do that sometimes, and, and here's the thing. I, honestly, I, do, I, I don't think that we always mean to do it. It just it comes out that way. Thankfully, thankfully, Jesus gives us a better approach. Not only does he give us a better approach, he actually shows us a better approach. He actually shows us that there is a better way. And so when you think about this, of all the marks of discipleship that Jesus could have highlighted, one of the things that, as we're going to see in today's text, in John chapter 13, that he highlights a willingness to pick up a towel and to get his hands dirty. To pick up a towel and to get his hands dirty dirty. And so following Jesus means that we set aside our desires and our wants in this world and we trade them for his wants and his desires for us. Because it's not about me. It's not about me. It means that we pick up a towel and we get our hands dirty and we get on our knees and we clean dirty feet. And what Jesus is going to show us is that following him is about serving others humbly. So let's look at this together. John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. We'll just read a few uh, verses, and then we'll come, come back and explain them and, and kind of point out a few things in them. So John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Now, it's something to understand here. It says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. So what's happening, what you need to understand is that Jesus is literally, he could count the, the, the hours away from the moment that he would be arrested, crucified, and would go to the cross. And so he is days away from this taking place. And so this is what it says. This is one of the things that happens here toward the end of his earthly uh, physical life with us here on earth. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. And I love this next part. It is so amazingly powerful, so beautiful. It says, he loved them to the end. We'll come back to that in a moment. So during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, then he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So, number one, if you're taking notes, you like to take notes, or you're just looking at the notes uh, that you got in version. the first thing is this, is that, number one, Jesus comes to serve you. Jesus comes to serve us. He comes to serve you. And so, one of the things that I, I love here, again, I said we'd come back to it. It says that he loved them to the end. And so, don't miss this. Jesus, he, he's in this room, and he's with these 12 men that, that he had picked out. They, he had went to each one of them three years before this and said, hey, I want you to come with me. I want you to follow me. And each one of them, in a different way, left what it was that they were doing. Some of them were tax collectors, some of them were fishermen, some of them were carpenters, some of them were other things. And, and they just left everything that they were doing, and they said, we're following you, we're going with you. And so they followed Jesus. 
And it said he loved them to the end. He had a deep, deep, deep love and compassion for these men. But the thing that, that we, we must not miss here is that not only did he have a deep, deep love and compassion for these men, Jesus has a deep, deep, deep love and compassion for you. For you and for me. How deep? Enough to give his life for you, even if you feel unlovable. He is loving you. He loves you deeply and compassionately. And so Jesus, because he loves them and he's painting a picture of what it means to, to love and to sacrifice the way that, that he is going to love and sacrifice for them, he gets down on his hands and his knees and he begins to wash their feet. And then think about this for a moment. The way that Jesus is serving them, the way that he is, he is loving them, the creator of the universe... The, the, the one who actually literally spoke the heavens and the stars and, and everything in this world, spoke it into existence. The very one who knew you, the scriptures tell us, knew you before you ever were, who literally knit you and put you together in your mother's womb, who knows everything about you, the way that you were made, the way that you feel, the way that you do certain things, like the way that, like all of the things about you that maybe you don't even know about you, he knows about us because he made us this way. He put us together. In John chapter 1, way back he, here in, in John 1, uh, John reminds us, he tells us that, that God, the Word, Talking about Jesus, he calls him the Word, the, the Logos, the, the Word became flesh, meaning that God left heaven, put on flesh, to enter into the mess of humanity, to be and to live amongst you and I, and to experience the whole human experience, the things that you and I experience. This is Jesus in the flesh, and he comes and God, the creator of the universe, comes and he gets down on the floor and he washes dirty, stinky, foot-funk feet. Ain't no odor eaters. Ain't no fast acting to actin'. Ain't no baby powder, right? Like, none of that. Can't cover it up with axe. Not that you should, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> but ain't, none of that, Right? And if you think about this, like, I mean, like, literally, like, I want you to get a visual picture of this because in the first century, they didn't have shoes like we have shoes. They had sandals if they had anything, and they're walking on dirt roads that when it would rain would be muddy, right? Like they're not, not riding in cars, you know, in getting out of, you know, of their house into the garage, into the car, like, never touching dirt right, with their shoes, like they're in the dirt all the time. The animals that walk the streets walk the same streets that they're walking. And so everything that comes with that, I don't have to explain that to you, everything that comes to that is also on their feet. And Jesus takes each one of their feet and washes it. Now, another interesting thing that, that we learn here that it tells us is that uh, not only does Jesus begin to, to wash their feet, but just a reminder of whose feet he also washes. Verse 2, during supper when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot. A few days from this moment, Judas will walk out of these doors and will walk down the street to the very people that wanted to arrest and crucify Jesus and say, hey, you want him? How much? 30 pieces of silver? Done. I'll take you to him. And Jesus knows this. And yet he still washes his feet. Still washes his feet. So I find it interesting, as I was thinking about this, I, I think about how Judas, he sat under Jesus' teaching. For three years, he sat under Jesus' teaching. He saw all of the miracles. 
He saw Jesus walk on water. He saw Jesus a few days before this raise a dead man back to life named Lazarus. Saw him heal a girl, bring her back to life. Saw a blind man be able to, to see again. Cast out demons. Judas saw all of these things. Judas went on mission trips. You remember that thing when Jesus took the 12 disciples and he said, Hey, I'm sending you out two by two. And they went on a mission trip together. And Judas went on the mission trip. He spent time with him. He was fed by him. He was loved by him. And yet Judas never believed him and ultimately would betray him. Judas never believed with his whole heart. His heart was never transformed. In fact, Judas's problem wasn't information. Judas had all the information in the, in the world. His problem was transformation. His heart was never transformed. His heart was hardened. And I find it interesting, you know, Judas, Judas was literally, he was in church every day. <laughs> Like every single day Judas was in church because he was with Jesus. Every single day he was in church. He gave. He served. He did all of those things, but he didn't believe. And it just is a reminder that we, like, if you want to follow Jesus, you have to eventually believe that he is who he says he is. Like none of these things, none of these things gain us access to heaven. It is only through Jesus Christ. It's only by proclaiming that he is the Son of God and that he gave his life up to serve you and I through his death on the cross. But it wasn't just his death, it was also his resurrection. Faking it till you make it doesn't make it. Faking it till you make it doesn't make it. And so Jesus, Jesus still yet served Judas in the same way that he served the other. And he has served you and I in the same way with grace and love for us through the cross. And so not only is he painting this picture, as we'll see here in just a moment, but he's also giving us a picture of what it means to, to be cleansed of our sins. But he, he has literally given his life to serve us. No one, and, and it's just a reminder to us that, that no one, there's not a single one of us in this room that is beyond the saving grace of God. Like grace, you can't, listen, you cannot out the cross of Jesus. Because grace is always greater. And there are some of you in the room, you feel like you are way far too gone. And Jesus is just like, no. In fact, I'll tell you why we know that. Is there's several reasons, but uh, not only do we see it just through the life of Jesus, but the writer of Hebrews, he says this, he says, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. How far away is the uttermost? Does anybody know how far uttermost is? Because I, I don't know how far it is. I just know it has to be a long ways. It's a lot, right? Jesus, listen, he says, Jesus is able. Like, they could have, been, they could have put a period at the end of able, and that would have been enough. Jesus is able to do what? Whatever. He's Jesus. But Jesus is able to save to the uttermost who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's Hebrews chapter 7. He's able to save to the uttermost. And then hundreds of years before Jesus would come and, and, and God in the flesh through Christ would be with us, the prophet Isaiah writes this in Isaiah 59.1. He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. That it cannot save. It means no matter how far off you feel, God's hand is not like God's hand is long enough to reach you, always, because He is able to save to the uttermost. He, that He cannot save, or His ear dull that it cannot hear. Jesus has served us, is serving us, but would ultimately serve us through His sacrifice on the cross. And He is painting this picture for His disciples in this moment. But let's read on. Verse 6, it said, He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And so, translation, Simon Peter, Peter's just saying, you're going to wash my feet too, right? 
Is, 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 why are you washing my feet is really what he's saying. And Jesus answered him and says, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Now that makes sense to us because we've read the rest of the story. Like we know what happens next. We know that the crucifixion is coming. We know that the resurrection is coming. We know, I don't know if you know this, but I know this, but I've read this book and we win, by the way. So, yeah, amen. And, and so Jesus knows this, but they don't know this. And so he says, he says, what I'm doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Now, why would Peter say that? Well, because for several reasons, typically, mainly because in the first century, the only people that washed anybody else's feet were the servants. Peter knew something about Jesus. Now, I'm sort of, this is sort of conjecture a little bit, but I think that Peter, was, he was kind of struggling whether or not he truly believed that Jesus was who he said he was in this moment. And we kind of see him struggle back and forth with that a little bit. But he had a pretty good idea because of the things that he had seen. And so Peter's like, what? No, 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 no. Lord, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus says to him this, he says, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, you've got to be clean. You've got to have forgiveness of your sins, Peter. Like every single one of us. It's not enough to be clean on the outside, but dirty on the inside. And Simon Peter, this is him essentially repenting and, and, and saying, yes, Lord, clean me. He says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He's saying my actions and my thoughts. You see, again, because it's not enough to just be clean, and that's what Jesus is conveying to him. It's not enough to, for us to just try to fake it till we make it, because we won't ever make it. It's not enough to be just clean on the outside and try to put together a good life and be good and act good and you know, just try to do good things. J Jesus is saying that you've got to be transformed. Like There has to be a heart trans transformation from the inside out. Like all of these things, like the serving, the giving, the going to church, like all of these external things, these things are a result of what happens on the inside. Like you don't do those things to ultimately get the transformation from the outside in, it's inside out. You know, I was telling you about uh, Daniel Morris, Staff Sergeant Daniel Morris. Well, there was a time that he was not Staff Sergeant Daniel Morris. He was a guy that I wanted to wring his neck. <laughs> and um, we were roommates together in, uh, while we were going to college. And one day I had, a, uh, had some friends coming over, and so I called him. And I said, hey, man, uh, I've got some friends coming over. And, of course, we're two single dudes living in an apartment together. You know what that apartment looked like. It stank. And so, like, there were dishes everywhere. We hadn't figured out that you're supposed to use, like, throwaway dishes. So we had real dishes, which meant you had to wash real dishes. We didn't like to wash real dishes. And so we had a lot of dishes stacked up and piled up all, all the time. And the kitchen had literally dishes everywhere. I don't know that we had anything that was clean. And I knew that. And so I called him. I said, hey, we've got some, some people coming over later tonight. Do you mind? Like, could you clean the kitchen? Would you mind doing that? He was like, yeah, man, I got it. No problem. No big deal. I'll do that. And so I get home, and I walk in, and I walk into the kitchen, and I could not believe my eyes. It was clean. It was clean. I was so excited. I was like, oh, my gosh, it's so clean. So later, had some friends over while kind of hanging out, and I asked them. I was like, hey, anybody want anything to drink? Yeah, sure. We'd love to have something to drink. So I go into the kitchen, walk in, go to the cabinet to get a glass out of the cupboard, and I open it up, and it is empty. There's no glasses, there's no cups in there. I go to the next one, nothing in there. I'm opening up like where our plates and all those things are supposed to be. Like nothing, there's nothing anywhere. We have no clean anything, but I don't even know where any of it's at. And so I start looking around and I think to myself, did he throw away everything that we had? Like seriously, come on. But no, 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 he did not. So I open up below the sink and there was every dirty dish that we had, still dirty, under the sink. Don't act like y'all didn't do that. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, okay, yeah, all right. But true story, so like there they are all under the, uh, under the sink. So again, the outside was clean, but the inside was dirty. 
And Jesus is saying, no, 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 like that, it, it's got to be inside out. You can't just clean the outside and, and, and everything be clean. And so Peter, Peter says to him, he says, I want you to wash all of me. Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus, listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said to him, he says, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but it is completely clean. And you are clean. But he kind of he turns things back around to Judas. He says, But not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said not all of you were clean. Remember, he washed Judas' feet. But he also said, but not all of you are still clean. It's dirty on the inside, clean on the outside. So number one, again, number one is that Jesus comes to serve you. He comes to serve us. Number two is this. Let's try to get down the mountain here. Number two is this, is that Jesus comes to show us how to serve. Not only does he come to serve us, but he also shows us how to serve. Look at verse 12. It says, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, he says, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash the feet of one another. And so it's very simple what Jesus says here. It actually means the same thing in the Greek and the Hebrew. Jesus says, to know me is to serve like me. He says, look at what I did for you. Now I want you to go and do the same for others. He says, I've given you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. And here's the thing. I don't see any exceptions to that in the scriptures. Why? Because I N A M. It's not about me. Jesus did not make it about himself. In fact, it's really kind of crazy. I was having this conversation with somebody out in the hall after uh, the 9 o'clock service this morning is that we were talking about how the economy of Jesus is upside down. Now, Jesus says that, what, he says what? He says the first will be what? Last, right? And, 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 but, but no, 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 no. It's like we, we kind of want it. We want it the other way, right? We want to be first. Like the, the last will become first. The first will be last, right? And Jesus says if anybody wants to save his life, he must what? He must lose his life. The, the, the economy of Christ is completely flipped upside down. And, and so Jesus is saying, I didn't come to be served, but I came to what? To serve. I am the creator. The, I, am, I am God. And yet I, I'm not asking you to, to serve me this way. I, I want to serve you first. And because of my serving of you, I'm asking you to do that for others. I'm asking you to serve in the same way that I have served you. Look at what he says next. Verse 15. He says, For I have given you an example that you should also do as I have just done to you. Truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. In other words, Jesus says it's not enough just to know them, but you will actually be blessed if you do them. And so church, we have to stop looking at serving, especially looking at serving others, like an inconvenience, but rather like an opportunity. Here's the thing. This, this morning, 8.30 this morning, we gathered together with our volunteers that were here for the, to serve in the 9 o'clock service and, and ministry leaders, and we got together, and, and we were talking about this. And, um, and, and I mean this in the most encouraging yet loving but kind of toe-stepping kind of way, too, is that we have to stop looking at serving others as an inconvenience and have to start seeing it as an opportunity because the opportunity far outweighs any inconvenience that you might experience. 
And so do you see serving people as an inconvenience or as an opportunity? Do you see serving people as an inconvenience as a, or as an opportunity? Because here's what I know about everybody in this room. It was somewhat of an inconvenience in some way, form, or fashion for you to even get here this morning. Like, I get that. Some of you got kids. You had to get them ready. You had to wrestle them. You had to get them fed. You had to get them in the car. You had to remind them that you're going to, if they'll be good, you're going to take them to the park when all this is over with. Maybe you didn't, but I just told you that you had to. And so now they know. Now it's on you. And so, like, like there's a level of inconvenience. Like, you had to get them up. Like, you had to get them out the door for our volunteers to get here to serve this morning. Some of them had to get here at 7, 7.30 to make the coffee that you, had, that you got to drink this morning to do all these things that you see on the stage. Like all of these things, there is a complete and total level of inconvenience. I get that. I totally get that. I know that because I do those things too. And I would never ask you to do anything that I'm not doing myself. But we have to stop seeing serving as an inconvenience and have to see start seeing it as an opportunity so is it an inconvenience or is it an opportunity yeah you know, I, I think about there are a lot of people actually that that do this in different ways but a couple of people came to mind this morning as i was thinking about this that uh, there are some people that i know it's a complete and total inconvenience for them to come and to serve here and to serve you and to serve me and to serve each other i think about um sherry and lynn Sherry and Lynn, they, they, they drive, if y'all know where this is, you know how far this is, they drive from Strawberry Plains to come here. They live in Strawberry Plains. And they drive from Strawberry Plains to come here. And they, and, and they do that. One of the things that I love is sometimes they show up at the 9 o'clock service. Like for some of us to get to the 9 o'clock service actually takes an act of God to get us here, literally, right, at, for the 9 o'clock service. That's why you come to the 11 o'clock service, all right? So, but they come and they will get here at the 9 o'clock service. And even if they're not scheduled to serve in guest services, they show up and they say, what can we do? Can we serve today? Can, what, what, what do you need us to do? I love that. There's... Um, uh, another lady in her family, um, Jamie, and Jamie lives in Andersonville, which is almost equally as far. It's on the whole other end of the county. Like, we're on this west end of the county. Andersonville is on the northeast end of the county. It's about a 40-minute drive. And some of you, th th I think of Joanna, who drives from, like, the Lenore City area, and others, like, some of you drive from a long, long distance, but yet you do that, and there's a level of inconvenience that is involved in that, but yet, I, this is what I know about you, is that you go, you know what, the opportunity and what Christ has actually called me into to do is far greater than any inconvenience that I will experience. But the rest of us, not the rest of us, because there are a lot of you that maybe don't look at it that way, but... If I could just be frank, we need, we need more of you doing this more now than ever. To set aside any inconveniences and to step into the opportunities. Uh, if you were here last week or you got uh, our email from earlier this week, I told you that we were going to make a really big announcement today. And if you knew that and came in today and you were like, He's like almost all the way through his message and he still has not made a big announcement. When are we doing this, right? Like you're just like itchy, right? It's like it's time. Uh, it is time. So uh, I'm going to make that to you right now. So here's the thing. Um, for a long time, and I say a long time, for the, our church is 10 years old and for the last probably eight years uh, uh, of the existence of our church, uh, we've been a part of a church planting network called the Ignite Church Network. Now what that means is that uh, we are heavily involved in training other church planters, sending church planters to start new churches up, and we've been able to do that. We've actually been able to, to do a lot of that o over the course of, of, of the last uh, eight years. Uh, there have been uh, multiple churches that we've helped start that, that you didn't even know that you were helping start, that, that I've been able to train their pastor or mentor their pastor, coach their pastor, and we've been able to financially resource a lot of those churches in different ways and do some other things. Some of you have went and served at events and other things for some of these other churches in the area that we've helped start, and so uh, that is, is a great thing. It's an amazing thing, and, and we are still a part of that, or are still going to be a part of that, but we want to go to the next level. We want to continue doing that in different ways, and so one one of the things that has happened over the course of the last 
uh, last couple of months is one of the churches that, that we have been a part of uh, to help start, to resource, and do other things with in Clinton, which is just the next city over from us, is a church called City Lights Church. And uh, Peyton and Ariel Wills uh, have been leading and, and been in that church uh, from its beginning. But uh, God is ending that chapter for them, and they are stepping out of that season and into a new season of ministry. They don't know what that is yet, and nothing bad has happened there. Nothing, nothing like has taken place there to, to make them step down. It's just they feel like God is leading them to a new place. And so because of that, it's created a sort of a vacuum, a void of leadership there. And they don't have a lead pastor. They, they don't have anybody on staff that could step into that place. And so we've come alongside them. And I, when I say we are elders, and so here at Ridge Church, we are led by a plurality of elders. That means that uh, I don't make all the decisions here. Like nothing, I'm not the bottleneck here. Nothing comes across me and I have the final say in things. We're part of a plurality of elders. And so we make those decisions together. There's six of us together that do that. Uh, I get to be the lead pastor because I got here first. And so uh, that's kind of how that works. But um, <laughs> so we've been praying and, and talking with them for a couple of weeks now. And so we basically uh, approached them uh, because they didn't really know what they were going to do or how they were going to do it and how they were going forward. And so the thing that they were facing, although they, they probably have a good bit of people who actually attend there on a regular basis because of the void of leadership that that was creating, uh, they were basically faced with two options. Option one was to just call it. Like, we're done. Five years, that's it. We've we got to close it down. And, and, or option two was, was that, that we bring them with us. And so that we partner with them in a way that allows them to remain City Lights Church in Clinton, Tennessee, doing the very things that God has called them to in the way that God has called them to do it. But yet we get to be a deeper, uh, closer partner with them in that process. And so because of that, so what's going to happen there at City Lights Church is in the next couple of weeks, uh, Pastor Peyton will be uh, stepping out and, and they'll be leaving. And so that t happens on June the 9th. And so beginning on basically June the 10th, City Lights Church will become a uh, part of or with us uh, as what we call the Gospel Collective Family of Churches. It's sort of the family within the network. And we hope that that network, we hope that that family continues to grow. We don't want city, like it's never been our plan to, uh, to have just one church a part of that network. We want to see multiple churches part of that. We don't know exactly what all of that looks like yet, but we do know this. We do know this is that God has called us to invest deeply in them and for them because we are trying to reach Anderson County for the gospel together. And for us, that means that we don't give up. God has not given up on them, and so we want to continue to invest heavily in them. And so by doing that, what that's going to do for us here and how all this sort of intersects with, with what we're talking about here today is that for some of us, what that's going to do is going to create a vacuum here of, of volunteers. Because some of you, we've already had, in fact, some people from the first service have already decided to do this. But one of the things that I'm asking some of you to do, and by asking like I'm asking you right now, I'm asking some of you to decide over the next week or two, to go and spend your summer serving at City Lights Church, volunteering there. I'm asking you to give up your seat here to go to Clinton and to serve at City Lights Church, serving their kids' ministry, to serve in their production ministry, maybe serving their band, wherever it is that is needed to serve. I'm asking you to go there and serve. But at the end of three, to three months, whatever it is, you've got to come back here, okay? You can't go anywhere. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Like, if God leads you there, if God sends you there and plants you there, then that's where you need to be. But I'm asking, I'm asking and some, of, some people have already decided to do that. And so by doing that, like, most of the people that are doing that already are volunteering here. And so what does that mean for here? That means that we need you to step up here, too, to get involved, to get engaged here. To start serving here, maybe it's in our guest, minister, our guest services by greeting and saying hello to people or helping make coffee or, or being back in the production area. Uh, maybe it's up here on stage in the band in some way or maybe it's in our kids ministry or in our student, wherever it is. Like we need you to serve. Why? Because Jesus calls us to calls us, listen, Jesus calls us, here, here's the thing, if we would all, one another, each other, 
we wouldn't have to worry about who's getting one anothered. That means that you would get served and I would get served and they would get served. Everybody would get served if I looked at you and said, I'm going to serve you. And you looked at your neighbor and said, no, I'm going to serve you. And then we looked at the next person, no, I'm going to serve you. Like we just all start trying to outdo each other, right? That's what, yes, amen. That's like, that's what, that's what we got to do together. That's what we are called to do. And so we need all hands on deck so that we can serve one another. And so I know that it might be a great inconvenience, but the opportunity is even greater. And so we need all of us to step up and to serve if you're not serving. Maybe, maybe God might be calling you to, to go and serve at City Lights Church. And we would love to see that happen too. The one thing that I that I want you to know, because like so just some uh, other details about this, like some of the other things that are going to be happening is, is we want uh, we want to have live teaching there at City Lights Church. So a lot of what you experience here at Ridge Church is going to be the same thing that you experience at City Lights Church. Same same type of kids ministry, same type of preaching messages, like all of those things. But but we want li- a live teacher there, and so we're praying and asking God to to raise up a local lead pastor for them. But in the process, while that is going on, I'll be spending some time there, preaching and teaching there. I'll still be here. I'm not going anywhere from here. I'll st- I'll still be here. Uh, also, Wesley will be there sometimes too. They've got one person who is a communicator who's going to be doing some of that. But again, it all like everything is a vacuum. And so because of that, we all got to step into to, to new places to be inconvenienced a little bit, but to know that by being inconvenienced, the opportunity is going to be even greater. And so the good news is that every ounce of ability to serve and to do any of this, it all flows out of the gospel. And because I know what you're thinking, you're thinking the same thing that I'm thinking. And it's like, how are we going to do this? And the only way that I know that we are going to do this is because we're going to get on our hands and knees and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to move and work. Because for 10 years, that's what we've done here. We're not going to stop now. And we've seen God do amazing and incredible things right here. There are so many of you in this room, your lives are pictures of what God has done in that process. And we're going to ask him to do it again we're going to ask him to keep doing it here and we're going to ask him to do it there for the kingdom of God for his glory for his honor not for our sake because it does not matter about the name out on the sign out there it matters about the kingdom being lifted up about Anderson County being reached for the gospel so that we can help others follow Jesus And so as we do this for each other, for City Lights, and for those where we do life, there is not a more clear picture of the gospel than humbling ourselves and getting on our knees and getting our hands dirty to wash the feet of others. This is what it means to humbly follow Jesus. So here's what I want to ask you to do as we uh, close up our time this morning. I simply want to ask you just to, to think and consider a couple of things. Number one, I want you to to just know and, and understand how, how great of a sacrifice that Jesus has given for each one of you and for me to serve you, to love you, to give himself up for you. And because of that, he says to us, now I want you to do the same. This, what, this thing that I've done for you, the way that I've served you, I want you to serve others in the same way. So, number one, if you, if you don't know the love of Christ in that way, I, I pray that today that you, would, that you would know that. That you would give yourself to him and to ask him to save you. And then secondly, for those of you in the room that maybe you're feeling the, the call and, and, and to, to step up, to step into a place to serve, then I would just say, even if you don't know where or what that looks like or, or what you need to do next, like just, just say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm willing. Whatever you need, I'm willing. We'll help you find that spot, wherever that spot is. And so 
before you leave today, take your Connect card and put it in the comment section. On your, make sure you put your information on it. Like, don't, you know, like chicken scratch it. But put your information on it, right? And in that comment section, say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to serve, or I'm willing to go to City Lights and serve, or I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And just put that on the back of your Connect card and drop it off at the table on the way out or, or use the online Connect card, richchurch.info. It's really easy, richchurch.info. Put it on, the, on that, and we will we'll talk with you. We'll get you into a place. We want you to serve where you're passionate, where you feel like you have a calling. And if you don't know what any of those th places are, we'll help you find it. We'll help you find it. We need all hands on deck. Have you ever been to, have you ever been to a potluck? How many of you have ever been to a potluck? You know what makes a potluck great? Does everybody bring some? Have <laughs> you ever been to a potluck where nobody brought anything? <laughs> no. no. It doesn't exist, right? That's right. Exactly. It's called a meeting. Amen. We've got to bring something. And God has given every single one of us in the room something to bring. And so let's bring it. And let's ask God to do what he has done here, to do it there, to do it again. So will you pray with me? Father, we are grateful and thankful, God, for your visible picture of what it means to serve and to be served. God, to, to love others with sacrificial, humble service. Because, God, that is what you have done for us. And so, Father, God, we pray this morning God, that you will propel us and send us, God, to love others around us in the same way. To the person sitting to the right, and to the left, front and the back, God, to the people outside of these walls, God, to the people in Oak Ridge and Anderson County and Clinton and wherever it is that you send us. God, you have done incredible things here ask you and beg of you and plead of you to do it again because we believe to you who is able to do far more abundantly than we could ever hope or ask for we are asking and it's in your name we pray amen and we stand to your feet we continue to just contemplate and and, and to consider these things and to pray through these things. And then we invite you to come and take communion when you're ready. There is no better picture of what Jesus has done for us than the body and the blood, the crackers and the juice. So we invite you to come when you're ready. There's communion available in that back corner if you're closer to that or right here down front.
you believe that, church? Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. I hope you do, too. Uh, hey, we are so glad that you were here this morning. And again, if you're watching on Facebook Live, Get richchurch.info, okay? Let us know in the comment section for all of us here together in the room. If I've not had a chance to meet you, I'd love to do that before you leave today. Uh, but be sure, if you get a chance, please take your Connect card or the online Connect card and, and let us know where you're ready to get engaged, where you're ready to serve, or if you're willing to, to maybe even go over to City Lights Church and do that, or, or whatever next step that God is calling you to. We want to help you take that next step. So before you leave today, be sure to do that. I love you guys. Happy Memorial Day weekend. We'll see you next week.